Hi everyone, welcome to this video where I will be doing an overview and review of the Nightbringer from Graham McNeil's Ultramarine series. The stage for Nightbringer is set with the short story Chains of Command, where Uriel Ventress is introduced as the veteran sergeant of the Ultramarine's 4th Company, second in command to Captain Edeus. The 4th Company is responding to a rebel uprising on the planet Thracia. The uprising is revealed to be caused by the Night Lords, who have turned most of the planetary forces heretical. With the fate of their mission dire due to the heretical onslaught, Captain Idaeus comes up with a bold yet daring plan that goes against most of the Codex Astartes teachings. Ultimately, the plan is carried out by Captain Idaeus, who heroically sacrifices himself to destroy the main bridges into the capital city of Thracia, securing the time for the Imperial forces to deal with the main threat. However, before the plan is carried out, Idaeus bequeaths to Uriel his mastercrafted power sword, or Uriel symbolically assumes command of the 4th Company. Nightbringer begins roughly six months after the events of Chains of Command, where Captain Ventress and his 4th Company are stationed on the crag, homeworld of the Ultramarines. Summoned by the Ultramarines chapter master Marnius Calgar, Uriel and his company are given the task of traveling to a planet called Pavanus, which is under scrutiny from the Administratum due to an ineffective government. Their mission is to escort an adept of the Administratum named Ario Barzano, whose goal is to restore order to the troubled planet. Chapter Master Calgar, however, makes a point to Uriel that he is personally responsible for Barzano's protection, which comes as a surprise to Uriel, seeing as how Lord Calgar emphasizes this. On Pavanus, Captain Ventress and Ariel Barzano learn that a, an organization called the Church of the Ancient Ways has been responsible for numerous terrorist attacks, which is contributing to the civil discord on the planet. In addition to the terrorist attacks, Pavanus and the surrounding planets in the local system have been subject to raids from the Dark Eldar. It is revealed that the Dark Eldar have a human collaborator on Pavanus, which confirms Barzano's suspicion that the unrest on Pavanus is part of a larger scheme involving the Xenos. It is discovered that a Necron tomb was unearthed on the planet, which is rumored to be the tomb of a Catan star god, the Nightbringer. Ariel Barzano is then revealed to be an inquisitor of the Order of Xenos and explains his real reason for being on Pavanus, which was to investigate the discovery of this tomb and the possible threat of the Nightbringer being reported. We learn that a man named Casimir de Valtos, one of the industrial cartel leaders on Pavanus, is revealed to be responsible for the civil unrest and eventual civil war that erupts to depose the current governor, as well as being the human collaborator with the Dark Eldar. His ultimate goal is to resurrect the Nightbringer, on the belief that the Nightbringer would grant him immortality as payment for releasing it. The Dark Elder collaborators were responsible for collecting the fragments from the nearby planets to open the Nightbringer's prison, and hope that the Nightbringer would allow them to collect and enslave the souls and miss the chaos of its return. Faced with the disastrous prospect of a Catan like the Nightbringer being released, Barzano is intent on issuing Exterminatus on Pavanus, which would obliterate the planet and prevent anyone and anything from awakening the creature. Uriel offers the plan to attack the mine where the Necron tomb was discovered, as they realize Devaltos' treachery and ultimate plan. This spares Pavanus' total annihilation. However, as Uriel, Inquisitor Barzano, and the Fourth Company reach the tomb, they are too late, as Devaltos and the Dark Eldar have released the Nightbringer. In the ensuing chaos, the Nightbringer, though terribly weak after its 60 million year slumber, is unimaginably powerful and proceeds to slaughter both Space Marine and Dark Eldar, feasting on their souls. In the fight, Inquisitor Barzano is killed fighting valiantly against the Dark Eldar and even held his own against the onslaught of the Nightbringer's presence. Unfortunately for Casimir de Valtos, he is mercilessly slaughtered by the Nightbringer, but not before he realizes how insignificant he was to this awesome creature. Uriel realizes that despite this creature's weakened state, there is no way to defeat it. Instead, remembering that the tomb that they are in is full of explosive gas, he threatens the Nightbringer with an armed melt bomb. Realizing this would entomb it once more, the Catan ceases its slaughter, but unfortunately escapes the mine. After the encounter with the Nightbringer, Uriel and the Fourth Company lay Inquisitor Barzana to rest and assist the planetary governor in quelling the last of the rogue forces. The Necron tomb is ordered to be bombarded from orbit, destroying it and any traces of the Nightbringer's resting place. So overall, I really, really liked this book. I thought it was a great read. It was really fun. Um, you know, even for its age, I think this was one of the earlier uh, Black Library books. I think it came out in 2002 or 2003, but still, it's still relevant today, especially if you're a fan of the Ultramarines like I am. Um, this is a great book to read if you want to see the Ultramarines a little bit more 
uh, I wouldn't say relatable, but I would say a little less uh, holier than thou um, than, than what they're characterized in some of the codex. I know there's been a lot of flack, you know, the Ultramarines get a lot of flack for being the poster boys and um, they can do no wrong, but Uriel Ventress as a character is actually quite, uh, not so much flawed, but he's, he's just, he's almost, he's just very human, you know, and it's, it's, it's interesting to read about a superhuman who's really more human than you may think, especially when he takes over the fourth company. He's actually quite self-conscious, and you wouldn't, at least me, I didn't expect to read about a space marine being somewhat self-conscious about his leadership skills, you know, whether or not he could lead the fourth companies as well as Ideas could, um, whether or not his men would like him, and things like that. And, it, and you know, those are just hinted at in the beginning of uh, Nightbringer. Uriel obviously assumes command like any good space marine captain would, um, but he holds on to Idaeus' sword almost as like a, a security blanket at first. You know, he, he uses it as something to remind himself that he is, in fact, the captain of the fourth company, and it wasn't a mistake that Idaeus chose him. But Uriel does grow into his role as the captain in one of the battles towards the end of the book. He's fighting the rebel planetary forces with the fourth company and his sword Idaeus's sword gets broken and that almost that symbolically shatters his security blanket he doesn't have that need to I guess fill Idaeus's shoes or run the company like Idaeus is more accurate to say that at that point he's leading his men his way he's leading the fourth company in the way that Uriel Ventress is leading the fourth company and not how um, Captain Ideas is leading the fourth company or how other people expect him to lead the fourth company, especially against a foe like the Nightbringer when they make their way towards the tomb and he comes up with the plan to confront Devaltos and the Dark Eldar that they know are down there. So the sword was a really clever way to show Uriel's character growth. And speaking of characters, the secondary characters in this book are awesome. Um, Sergeant Pisanius, Uriel's closest friend and his one of his veteran sergeants after he becomes captain is like the ultimate right-hand man. He's always got Uriel's back. Um, his other veteran sergeant, Lurkus, Lurkus, I think his name is pronounced, uh, he and Uriel actually had a bitter rivalry when they were going through ultramarine training. And to see their interactions is pretty unique in that Lurkus is very, very much a follower of the Codex Astartes. He's just, uh, he does not budge from those teachings at all. He's very conservative, whereas Uriel is more on the school of thought of Ideas, where, you know, the Codex Astartes is more of a, a, uh, a guideline versus a holy tomb that Lurkus and the majority of the Ultramarines at first uh, believe in it. I mean, they, they do regard it as, as a holy scripture that their Primarch wrote but um you know it, uriel uses his head also like Idaeus did versus blindly following the codex of Stardust. and we see more of that fleshed out in warriors of ultramar which i will be doing a video after this one but it's explored uh in a lot more detail in warriors of ultramar uh ariel barzano is a really great character um it's a pretty big reveal when he uh, reveals himself to be an Inquisitor. You have no idea beforehand that he's anywhere even close to being an Inquisitor. He puts on a facade of being some sort of uh, scholarly adept who's just kind of getting in the way at first and kind of annoying a lot of the Space Marines. But then he pretty he throws down when the you know stuff hits the fan and he just kind of shows up as this Inquisitor and everyone's going, "Oh my God, you're an Inquisitor!" And he says, "Yep, and here's what I'm here for." And it's, it's, it's a really cool reveal. I, I thought it was great. It was also cool to read a lot about the political landscape in the 40K universe. I mean, the whole reason they came to Pavanis in the first place was under the premise that Pavanis' government was ineffective, which it was, and all these riots were happening, and the civil landscape was just falling apart. 
Um, so it was cool to kind of see that side of it. I mean, me playing the tabletop game for so long, you only ever kind of think about the war side of it. And while Pavanus's issues were really just a mask for the Necron tomb to be discovered by DeValtos and trying to get the Nightbringer out, it still was cool to see some of the uh, political branches of the Administratum, like the Adeptus Arbides and how the governor's office works and the, at least Pavanus as a manufactorum planet, how that works and what its purpose is and everything like that. So one thing to note about this book, however, is that when it was written, the Necron lore at the time was that the Catan were fully formed star gods. There was only, I think, two at that time, you know, the Nightbringer and the Deceiver in that codex in particular. But in fifth edition, the Necron lore obviously was uh, overhauled, it was retconned, and the Catan were shattered into a billion pieces or so by the Necrons. And so this Nightbringer is actually a shard of the original Nightbringer that was shattered. So when you read this battle and see how powerful this shard is, uh, it's unimaginable how powerful fully formed Catan is, which puts into perspective the scale at, at what kind of monster they were fighting and why Barzana was so adamant about not letting this thing get out into the cosmos and everything even though that technically yeah now it's a shard but still a shard of the Catan, a shard of the nightbringer being that powerful i mean the fourth company got absolutely thrashed by this thing the dark eldar also you know pisanius got his arm lopped off effortlessly and ends up with a pretty sweet bionic arm afterwards however uh not to give too many spoilers that becomes a major point in some of the later stories with the interaction of the Nightbringer and Pisanius' skin and the bionic that he gets eventually. So overall, like I said, this is a really good book in my opinion. It's a fun read. There weren't too many dry parts in it. Uh, it was really engaging. So if you haven't checked it out, I would definitely recommend picking it up and giving it a read. And with that, that's the end of my overview and review of the Nightbringer. If you were listening, I hope you enjoyed it, and I'll see you in the next video.